A wall of protection is a reference to God's law, which is very basic to understanding his character. This study will show how God's law is to be rightly understood as something that God has given for our protection. With issues such as the character of God and even the gospel itself and how it works, it is important to understand the words we are using correctly, in the sense they are used biblically. There are many words, including the word law, involved in correctly understanding the character of God and the gospel that are misunderstood. That's why I have started a project to examine the definitions of a number of important words and build a glossary for them. I just wanted to draw your attention to it as it will be helpful to study the words we're going to look at in this presentation and others that you might be interested in. It is available at my website, uh, characterofgod.org, at the glossary page. There will also shortly be a preliminary edition of a flipbook version pictured here, available from the same web page. So many important words are misunderstood, and they affect our understanding of God and of the gospel, of what constitutes salvation. There will likely end up being about 80 words in the glossary when it's complete. The glossary will take a careful look at each word, including definitions from dictionaries, both modern and 200 years old, and other sources. Most importantly, it considers how the Bible itself uses words to help clarify the meanings. Of course, we can't deal with all the terms in this video. There is a logical order in which to work to understand them. Here I have suggested an order for some of the major terms. Note that this is not saying that one always leads to the other, as in one causing another. Law certainly does not cause sin. It is more like because God is love, he gave us laws for our protection and happiness. The breaking of God's law, understood as sin, must be dealt with in a just way, etc. So correctly understanding God's love will help you to correctly understand his law, which will help to correctly understand sin, etc. The focus in this presentation is on law, but we will look a little at terms around it to help in its understanding. God gave laws because of his love. When we break laws, there are consequences, so we have to consider these other terms. So we will start with love, as love is a central attribute of God's character. It is defined in scripture in this verse, He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. That love is other-seeking, not self-seeking. Does not behave itself unseemly, love, that is, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked thinketh no evil. That is speaking of charity in the King James Version. The King James Version translators used charity, especially in this chapter, to emphasize that agape is a selfless, giving love. Here it is in other versions. It does not dishonor others. It, that's love, is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. That's the New International Version. And the New Living Translation says, Or rude, it, that is love, does not demand its own way. It is not irritable, and it keeps no record of being wronged. Take note that love keeps no record of wrongs, and it keeps no record of being wronged. The omniscient God does not forget our sins. He does not forget. It means he does not remember our sins, like we would say in a certain tone of voice to someone who has wronged us, I'll remember that. Meaning, of course, you will pay for that, or I will get even with you. No, God does not do that. God forgives, but he does not have amnesia. My belief is that God is love. God is good. God is out to make others happy. So if God is love, if, if his love is not self-seeking, if he is out to make others happy, then wouldn't his laws be made for the good of others rather than for himself? I have often said to the study group I am privileged to share with, God's ultimate purpose is to make as many people as possible, as happy as possible, for as long as possible. Now let's consider God's law. If God's goal is to make us happy, if his character is love, others seeking love, it makes sense that all of his laws would be designed according to what? Well, according to love. His character of love, others seeking love. So I'm going to use the term design law to mean that all of God's laws are designed according to his character and regarding how things are designed to work. Here are some examples of design law. 
The first few have a big effect on behavior, our behavior, and the last few we have virtually no control over. So examples of design law, the law of love, that is the basic law of life for all living beings, the law of liberty, the prince, which is the principle of freedom, the law of exertion, we know that as use it or lose it, the law of sowing and reaping, there are consequences to everything, laws of health, the, such as nutrition, rest, etc., laws of heredity, we can bless our offspring or we can curse them through what we do, our choices. Laws of mathematics, we know those don't change, and laws of physics, such as gravity and others. God's law could also be categorized into moral law and natural law. Couldn't the moral law of God, who is love, simply be to always treat others in the most loving way, whatever the circumstance? Isn't that what we are actually told? Jesus was asked, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? And he replied, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. On these two hang all the others. In a sense, that should be all God needs for his moral law. From the great principle that God is love, we have the two great commandments, love God and love others. On these two hang all the others. The Ten Commandments are really love God and love others in more detail. The statutes and judgments are more detail yet. Largely, they are more detail that we needed because we were not following and didn't know how to follow the simple principle of other-centered love. And in the Sermon on the Mount, we are told that all of these are not just external laws, but they extend even to the thoughts and intents of the heart. We would think of all this as primarily moral law and things to help us understand and keep the moral law. Of course, there are natural laws as well, gravity and others. That is also God's law, and all of God's laws have natural consequences if transgressed. We certainly know that about gravity. God's laws, all of them, in a sense, act as a guardrail, or a wall, a wall of protection, I'm calling it. If we keep God's law, we, in a sense, receive some protection. So what does it take to keep the law? Paul tells us in Romans that if you love others, you have kept the law. Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. It helps me to think of it like this. God's law equals love. God's laws, or rules, are how to put love into action. There will be more to say about law to make it more understandable, and of course that is the focus of this presentation. But let's for a moment continue through the short list of terms. We want to understand how law fits into the bigger picture. So let's look at sin. Is it wrong to steal? Of course it is. Is it wrong to not love your neighbor? Yes. It would seem that would be even more wrong because to love your neighbor is included in the greatest commandment. If you always loved your neighbor, would you even need to be told not to steal from him? No. Is loving God and loving your neighbor an action? No. It is more of, of an emotion, or an attitude, or a state of mind, but it would be manifested in actions. Never mind the actions, have you ever found it difficult to even have a loving attitude towards a person? You know, some people are just hard to love. Here is something that helps me. Are we commanded to love people who we do not like, people who rub us the wrong way, who are obnoxious towards us? Yes, we are told to love them, but that does not mean we have to like them or what they do. To love someone is to wish the best for them, to be kind to them, to do to them as we would want them to do to us. But it doesn't mean we have to like what they do or become their best friends. In fact, there is scripture advising us about choosing friends. In Psalm 1.1 it says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, 
nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. If you want to avoid sinning, it is good to avoid getting too friendly with sinners. I like this definition of sin. Sin is lack of conformity with the will of God in one's physical nature, that is, the sinful flesh, uh, what we are born with and have no control over, individual acts, referring to breaking the law, and mental attitude or rebellion, do you trust or distrust God? Let's expand a little on those, the physical nature. The root problem is not the physical nature, as even Lucifer was physically perfect when he sinned. Remember, Lucifer was perfect in all his ways till iniquity was found in him, it says in Ezekiel 28.15. Having a perfect physical nature is not a guarantee of not sinning. And of course, we have no say in the physical nature we came with. Psalm 51.5 says, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Nor are individual acts, while they might be serious, the real problem. We, in our unrenewed mental state, do not even have complete control over our actions. That is why, after conversion, we can still do wrong, even when we don't want to. Sins, the individual acts, are symptoms of a sickness, of a deeper problem. The real problem is not our physical nature or our sins, the individual acts, but our attitude towards God and his law of love. It's our mental attitude. Are we in a state of rebellion? Do we trust or distrust God? If we will change our attitude towards God, that's called repentance, then, then he can work in our lives to make the changes so that we will have more and more control over our actions. It is what John the Baptist referred to when he spoke of taking the axe to the root. The real problem lies in our heart, our mind. Consider verses such as these. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. And from Proverbs, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. We all receive the same diagnosis because we all have the same problem, and we all show the same symptoms, sin. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is a strong connection that we need to understand between the law and sin. The purpose of all those laws was and is to point out to us as a diagnostic tool the condition of our sinful hearts so that we will feel the need of a cure. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Wherefore, then serveth the law. It was added because of transgressions. The law, the individual rules, are there as diagnostic tools to point out our disease. We needed the laws to show where we were not acting in a loving manner. Along with the whole gospel message, the law was to point us to the solution. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. The law is also there to keep us safe and well. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. Paul was very aware that he had a problem. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Paul was so aware, I think because he had come to understand the law and its claims upon him. Earlier he had been a strict legalist, as touching the law a Pharisee. Paul was given a prescription to trust in God and follow his ways. Then it was just a matter of clearing up the symptoms. Our need is to have our condition brought to our attention, to choose to go to the doctor and to trust in him or her. It can be helpful to use a medical analogy to understand the role of the law in the gospel. The gospel can be well illustrated by a medical analogy. Looking at the analogy, we present to the doctor with physical symptoms. We can choose to trust in the doctor and then receive a diagnosis of a disease. We can then accept the prescription or treatment from the doctor and hopefully physical symptoms are then relieved. Comparing that to the law and the gospel, 
we also show up with symptoms of sin. We can choose to trust in the great physician and from him receive a diagnosis, which is really the heart problem that we have. Then we can look to Yeshua, his life, his word to be cured. And from that we can have our sin symptoms relieved. So the law shows that we have committed acts of sin, which are symptoms, diagnosing that we have a, a disease, a sinful heart. That sinful heart is, in fact, a terminal condition. When a person falls into sin, that disease, what needs to happen? Well, a treatment to hopefully cure the diseased state. And that is the right thing to do, the just thing to do, to save the patient. When a person falls into the spiritually diseased state, they need a remedy, but they usually get this, or the wrong concept of it. Let's look briefly at the next stage, justice. I am focusing on law, so don't want to get into the other aspects too much. But be aware that we tend to think of justice very much like this. Whether we bring our enemies to justice, or bring justice to our enemies, justice will be done. When did President Bush say that? Well, it was just after 9-11. He was thinking of retributive justice, the getting even kind of justice, not of restorative justice, the kind that seeks to remedy the disease, to undo the harm done, even the harm done to the perpetrator of the act. In looking for a definition of justice, we can go to Webster's 1828 Dictionary. Here is Webster's first definition for justice. The virtue which consists in giving to every one what is his due. Practical conformity to the laws and to principles of rectitude in the dealings of men with each other. Honesty, integrity in commerce, or mutual intercourse. That does not sound much like retributive justice. Even a modern dictionary lists what most people associate with justice as only definition number five. Here it says, the administering of deserved punishment or reward. Somehow in Christianity we have a very specific and limited view of justice, much more so even than society in general. We think, you do the crime, you do the time. The penalty must be paid. Someone has to pay the price or justice is not satisfied. We should consider what the purpose of justice is. Biblically, justice is doing the right thing, which for God is to restore to a right state, to heal and to save. It can be thought of as to set us right in our relationship with him. We use justification in the same way today. Justification is to bring something in line with the standard. Justification can also be understood and defined as to set things right. We use the term that way today. Think of print on a page and how it can be justified or lined up to the margins of the page. This paragraph I'm reading is not justified. Justification is to bring something in line with the standard. In the case of the paragraph from the previous slide, here the lines of print are justified, or we could even say made right. They are lined up with a standard, the right edge of the page. If you look at all 28 occurrences of the word justice in the King James Version Old Testament, you will not find even one of those verses that says God administers retributive punishment. This is not meant for you to read here. It's just an image of my webpage listing all 28 uses of the word justice. It is linked to from the glossary page at characterofgod.org. Biblical justice is so misunderstood because of our preconceived ideas. For example, we read, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. We assume this is God's requirement for justice. But it was not a prescription for justice, but more of a limit on the human application of it, a limit on retributive justice or revenge. Even worldly wise men understood that retributive justice or revenge only perpetuates the problem. An eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. That retributive violence is not a good principle to live by is witnessed by the notorious feud of the Hatfields and McCoys in the 1800s in Kentucky and West Virginia. Dozens of people on both sides were killed over nearly 30 years. It was not just the occasional death that was so bad, but the constant threats and tension for no other reason than out-of-control revenge. Jesus taught us about revenge and justice. He said, But I say unto you, that ye resist not evil, 
But whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. Sometimes there just seems to be a tension between what we read in the Old Testament and the New Testament. We would do well to understand the Old Testament in light of the New Testament, especially the life and words of the Messiah. The law is a transcript of what? Of God's character, especially the law as in the principle of love. What is a transcript? It's a written record. And can you get to know someone from a written record? Well, only partly. How can you really get to know someone? In person. That's how you really get to know. It is in the person of Jesus that we can best understand God's character and his principles of justice. So we have looked at the progression, love, law, sin, and justice. Let's go back to our main focus, the law, and consider more about why were so many laws given? What is the purpose of the law? If loving God and loving others are the greatest commandments and they encompass all actions, what was the need for the Ten Commandments and many others besides? Does God make laws to exalt himself? Is he egotistical? Are his laws arbitrary? Is it, I am the creator, the one with the power, I can make whatever laws I want, and you had better obey? Are God's laws for his good or for ours? If God truly is love, other-centered agape love, then his laws must be for our good. This has a lot to do with God's attitude towards us. For our good or for his? This could bring up the question of God's humility. Was Jesus humble? Yes, he was. Was he showing what the Father is like? Yes. Is the Father humble? Well, he must be. Then what about a verse like this? In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Remember, Satan's heart was lifted up, a way of saying he was filled with pride. Here is another verse that uses the same phrase from the same original words, the only other one. And upon the cedars of Lebanon that are high and lifted up, and upon all the oaks of Bashan. The cedars of Lebanon do not lift themselves up. God does not lift himself up, does not exalt himself. The form of the verb in both of these verses is in the passive, indicating that someone or something else is doing the lifting. Think of this verse. Then I looked, and behold, in the firmament that was above the head of the cherubims, there appeared over them, as it were, a sapphire stone, as the appearance of the likeness of a throne. In that verse, the angels are lifting him up. Perhaps they appreciate how great and even humble he is and want to show him off. He is not self-aggrandizing, he is self-sacrificing. God is not lifting himself, it's the cherubim that are lifting him on his throne. He lets others lift him up. Does that ring a bell with anyone? In John 12 it says, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. And this, of course, was Jesus referring to being lifted up on the cross. So we have looked at love, law, sin, and justice, and how they are related to each other. Let's look more carefully at God's law. God's law is for our good, for our protection, to show us how to treat others, to make us know where we are going wrong, to point out sin. How does it function? Remember, we mentioned the term design law. That is better understood when compared to how some might conceive of God's law as being arbitrary. I used a word there that we should be clear on the meaning of, arbitrary. We need to talk about that for a minute. The dictionary defines it as subject to individual will or judgment without restriction, contingent solely upon one's discretion. An example of an arbitrary law would be a speed limit. Someone just decided that a curve in the road should be 70 kilometers an hour and not 60 or 80. Some cars will go around it faster than 90 with no problem. There is no natural consequence that will happen whenever someone goes slightly faster than 70. And since there may not be a natural consequence, for the law to have any power over us, a penalty is imposed. If you usually don't get a ticket for speeding, it is not because there is no imposed penalty. It is just lack of enforcement capability. Natural law says that when the centrifugal force exceeds a coefficient of friction between the tires on the road, the car will slide. 
It will happen at different speeds depending on tire and road conditions, but whenever the physics reach a certain point, the result will occur. God's laws are design laws, natural laws, consequential laws, uh, sowing and reaping. They are always for us, not for him. Most people think of God's law as having imposed punishments, but God's law is neither arbitrary nor imposed. Scripture tells us that his laws are for our good and that the consequences for disobedience are consequential. Here are some examples showing that the consequences of sin come from the sin itself. His mischief shall return upon his own head, and his violent dealing shall come down upon his own pate. Evil shall slay the wicked, and they that hate the righteous shall be desolate. Thine own wickedness shall correct thee, and thy backslidings shall reprove thee. And more examples. For the wages of sin is death. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. And I have a web page with uh, many more examples like that. Here is an illustration showing how God's laws work within two different models of the gospel. On the traditional legal model side, because God is sovereign and regards himself as a lawgiver, he gave laws for us to obey. Those laws are arbitrary. They are what God felt like including the day he made his list. The laws are imposed upon us as requirements to be obeyed. And that can be kind of like trying to fit a round peg into a square hole. God's role in this model is dictator. He dictates the rules. On the biblical healing model side, because God is love and regards us with other-centered love, he gave laws for our protection. Those laws are natural. They relate to particular risks that man needs protection from. The laws are put around us as a hedge of protection. God's role in this model is protector. He protects and provides. Those model titles may sound a, li a little biased, but I use them to make a point. The legal model, also known among theologians as the penal model or the forensic model, is based on tradition. The healing model, I believe, is based on the Bible, or I wouldn't be sharing it. There is a profound difference. Let's picture how the law protects in the healing model. God has laws for our good, our protection, essentially as a wall around us. The problem is that we keep doing this. We keep breaking down the wall of protection, trying to escape his laws to go after the temptations that are out there. But then Satan can get access to us through the weak area in our protection, the breach in the wall. We might go even further and in a state of rebellion cast off God and step outside of the wall of protection. Then we are totally unprotected and Satan can get direct access to us and you don't want that to happen. It may be an illness or any number of problems but in too many cases, people will blame God, not realizing what is really happening. They are thinking, why is God doing this to me? What they need to do is to turn to God in faith and trust him and ask for his help. Then he will send the protection they need. If they will stay within the bounds of his laws of protection, they will again be safe. What is the consequence of not staying within God's law, that wall of protection? We become subject to attacks of the devil, physical harm and illness, reprisals of others, long-term consequences. Uh, it could be smoking, which increases the risk of cancer. So that is how the law protects us. The law is there to keep us safe, and when we step outside of its protection, to make us aware of what we have done. Now, another illustration. Imagine you have a family with young children. You believe your child will obey if you impress on him the seriousness of your warning to never play with the pesticides stored in the garage. You tell him if he does, he will get a good spanking. You may have to imagine this was a generation ago. One day your child gets into the forbidden products, even ingesting some and becoming violently ill. You rush your child to the hospital, where after considerable medical effort, he is saved from death, barely. Are you now required, in order to satisfy justice, and because you had said you would, to spank your child? No. The warning was for their benefit, to protect them. 
The sin paid its own price, the child suffering and almost dying. Your job is to love that child and do all you can towards a complete recovery. God warns us against what is dangerous, what will hurt us. When we disobey, we suffer the consequences of our actions. God then does all he can to rescue and restore us. Another illustration. Again, you have a young child who has just learned to ride a bike. You have cautioned him about trying to ride when you are not there to supervise. You have mentioned that the driveway slopes down to the road with traffic and cars parked on the side that obscure drivers' views of your driveway. One day, when you think he is playing in the basement, you happen to go to the front window to see him just starting to roll down the driveway towards the road, and there is traffic coming. You just have time to throw open the window and loudly scream at him to stop. Stop, or I will... Some strong enough threat to really get his attention. The neighbor next door, who can't see what is happening but can hear your loud threats, might think you are an abusive parent, but you are entirely willing to risk that because this is a life-or-death situation. I think maybe God gave us families to help us learn some lessons about him. The point is this. There were times when God had to turn up the volume, to send a warning, to get through to people who were hard of hearing, more like hard of understanding. It seems that the term often used for them, the children of Israel, was for good reason. God was like a parent having to deal with some very unruly children. Which leads to something else that is important to share. I would like to look at something that is very important in understanding God's law and why there is such a range in understanding it. Dr. Lawrence Kohlberg was an American psychologist who developed what is now known as the Kohlberg Scale of Moral Development. Here is a brief description of the seven levels adapted from his research. Number one, level one, is reward and punishment. An action is wrong if we are punished for it. We think of young children who are at the starting point in learning. It's a slave mentality. Do what you are told. It does not require much thinking. It is describing Israel after coming out of Egypt. Level two, marketplace exchange. It's the let's make a deal mentality, the prosperity gospel, an eye for an eye, This is the level of retributive justice. It's Israel at Mount Sinai saying, All that the Lord hath spoken we will do. So they were promising to act morally in exchange for God's protection and supply of their needs. Level 3. Social conformity. Here, right and wrong is determined by community consensus. Everyone else is doing it. There is little reasoning required. It's the herd mentality. It's ancient Israel demanding a king like other nations. Israel is thinking it is right to have a king because everyone else has one. Level 4. Law and order. Here, right and wrong is determined by rules. It is right to punish wrong and reward good actions. We need to memorize rules, but there is no need to know why. It was the people in in Israel in Christ's day saying, We have a law. The Pharisees were very big on the letter of the law. Level 5. Love for others. Right is doing what is best for others. Circumstances, not rules, determine what is right. It's the Good Samaritan who ignored rules to help one in need. Parents praise or threaten discipline to a child depending on the situation. Parents are doing their best to protect, heal, and promote the welfare of their children. Level 6 is principle-based living. Right and wrong is determined by principles on which life is based. It recognizes that laws can make marijuana legal, but they can't make it safe. It is choosing to do right based on principle. God says what is right because of design, not not just because he said so. And level seven is a friend of God. This is someone who understands that something is right because that's how God designed it, not just because he said so. It's someone who understands God's design and purposes for life and cooperates with them. John 15.15 says, Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. We need to understand God's law and how it is designed. God is not meaning to treat us like unthinking slaves or animals. This is not trying so much to say anyone is not morally developed, but to point out that people can be at different levels 
and it is growing in our understanding of Scripture that will help us to develop morally, especially in how we view God's law. The Bible teaches that life is designed around the principle of love, not around arbitrary rules and punishment. Love for others results in values such as modesty, humility, and wise stewardship. Application of those values may mean a person does not purchase expensive jewelry, flashy cars, or other items for show or to promote self. A person at level 7 would have no problem living with such values, but a person at level 4 might hold to legalistic rules regarding dress, but not consider a flashy car to be on the list. They're going more by lists than principles. I think Satan has tried to dumb us down when it comes to moral development. Have you heard people say things like, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it for me? You may even have said that for yourself at some point. I probably did too. No offense intended, but we need to think things through more than we do, to always consider the larger context and the principles behind everything. God wants more than level four, because I said so, blind obedience. He says, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And he would much rather relate to us as friends. Let's consider two people who were actually called friends of God. The first was Abraham. He was called a friend of God. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. Remember, just before the destruction of Sodom, Abraham was pleading with God to save it. Abraham actually said to God, That, referring to the destruction of Sodom, be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? It's like Abraham was saying, Shouldn't you, God, do the right thing? And he went on to bargain with God. Unfortunately, God could not save Sodom, as there were so few that wanted his protection. The point here is that Abraham, as a friend of God, could relate to him in that way. Another example is that of Moses, of whom whom we are told, And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face, as a man speaketh unto his friend. There was an interesting incident where God was testing Moses' faith. The people of Israel were being particularly stiff-necked, and God, speaking to Moses, said of them, Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. Moses' reply was, Lord, why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, For mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy fierce wrath, and repent of this evil against thy people. Was this a rebellious reply, or was Moses being a friend, trying to look out for the honor of his his friend? So Abraham and Moses are two examples who were called friends of God, who I believe were at a high level of moral development. They knew God well enough that he was willing to reveal things to them, and even to consider their responses. A person at level 5 recognizes that God does not just make arbitrary laws, that his laws are for our good. So Abraham and Moses were friends of God. However, the Israelites were more familiar at this point with the gods of Egypt than the God of Abraham. Most of those pagan religions were fear-based. You had to do things like appease the gods by sacrifice to get them to be nice to you. Like the parent and the child on the bike, God sometimes had to raise his voice to get the respect of his people. This verse is interesting. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God has come to prove you, and that his fear may be before your faces, that ye sin not. Fear not, that his fear may be before your faces. Here is the verse from the New American Standard Bible, which I think is more clear. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid, for God has come in order to test you, and in order that the fear of him may remain with you, so that you may not sin. Don't be in fear. Don't be afraid of the thunder and lightning and quaking of the mountain. That is just to get your attention, so so you will learn to fear as in respect God, and not sin. 
Fear, meaning respect, is used in other places and cannot mean to be afraid, to be scared of God. It would contradict so much. You cannot win love through intimidation and threats. Yet God used fear. The main point to get out of this is that God takes into account our circumstances and our level of understanding. He takes them into account and makes allowances for them. The term for this is accommodation. Here are some examples of accommodation. Uh, Moses being in, appointed as an intermediary between God and the people. The Israelites choosing warfare. God giving the Israelites quail to eat. Uh, a searching the land. The granting of a king for Israel. Allowing them to have slaves. Allowing polygamy and divorce. I will expand on a couple of those. And there's more information on my website. Let's look at a couple of examples. And the Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with thee, and believe thee forever. And Moses told the words of the people unto the Lord. It is saying that God wanted the people to hear him when he spoke. Then in chapter 20, God spoke the Ten Commandments, and the people were very afraid. Their response was, They said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear, but let not God speak with us, lest we die. God's response was, The Lord said unto Moses, Thus thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, Ye have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. From that point on, God gave all the instructions up to chapter 24 to Moses, and then in chapter 24, And Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord. So God was here making an accommodation by speaking to Moses and having Moses act as an intermediary between himself and the people to relay God's instructions to them. And here is likely the most obvious example, the granting of a king for Israel. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. Samuel must have recognized there was a problem with the request, as he brought it right to God. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. Now therefore hearken unto their voice, howbeit yet protest solemnly unto them, and show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. God said to grant them their request, which was an accommodation, even though it was not the best for them. And he told Samuel to explain to them why it was not a good idea, which Samuel did. And Samuel told all the words of the Lord unto the people that asked of him a king. And he said, This will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He will take your sons for his army, your daughters for his kitchen, your fields and vineyards for his servants, a tenth of your seed and your sheep. Even after having the dangers of an earthly monarchy explained to them, they still insisted on having a king and replied, Nay, but we will have a king over us. And Samuel heard all the words of the people, and he rehearsed them in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto their voice, and make them a king. The people did not entirely reject God. They just rejected God's role of reigning over them and directing their affairs by the prophets. So God granted them their wish. Is this God requiring strict obedience to the letter of the law, or is he accommodating somewhat? So are God's requirements being altered in some of these examples? We think sometimes of this verse from Daniel being like God's laws. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing, that it be not changed, according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. Is the law of God following the example of the Medes and Persians, or is it the other way around? We would naturally say the other way, because God's law came first. But is it always true that God's law can't be altered? As far as the principles, God is love, love God, love others, his moral law, design or natural law. Can those be altered? No, the principles are unchangeable, so no, they can't. But in application, rules to govern behavior in various circumstances? Yes. 
God added lots of laws as he saw we needed them. He altered his requirements. The examples of accommodation I give earlier, and there are many of them. One example is Hebrews 7.12, the law regarding eligibility for the priesthood. For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. God will always do the most loving thing where earthly governments, like the Medes and the Persians, might not, probably because of pride. By now you may be thinking about this presentation. That's different. You may have long understood that God is sovereign, and he made the laws he wanted, and every transgression of those laws must be paid by someone to satisfy justice, whoever that is, so that God can then forgive. Now you see this study suggesting that God's laws function not as imposed laws, but as a wall of protection, not from God himself, but from the built-in natural consequences of sin and that the law's main purpose is to identify our sinful symptoms so we can know our sick condition and seek the remedy God freely offers. Perhaps you have understood somewhere in between. However, most of modern Christianity believes much differently than the early church and what the Bible teaches. How and when did this change in thinking happen? How did we get into such a misunderstanding about God's law? Paul recognized the danger in his time. I marvel that ye, talking to the Galatians, are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. After seeing the apostasy in Galatia, he feared the same could happen to the Ephesians. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, that is the Ephesians, not sparing the flock. But beyond Paul's day, were there major changes and deceptions involved in understanding the law of God and even the gospel itself early in church history? You are no doubt familiar with this verse from Daniel 7. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. We understand this verse to be a reference to a change made early in church history to God's laws, specifically to some of the Ten Commandments. The apostolic church would have understood God's laws to be design laws, because that is what they are. However, we know that the Jewish leaders viewed it much differently as imposed law for which infractions needed to be punished. Remember, we have a law, and by our law he ought to die. Another time they said, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But change the law of God? How foolish! That is like a meeting where people are discussing how they are going to change the law of gravity. For anyone to think they can make changes to God's law and enforce those changes, they must first believe that that is what God does that his design laws are arbitrary and therefore can be changed. This thinking was prevalent even in apostolic times, so it was no problem in the minds of people a few centuries later. In the time of Constantine in the early 4th century AD, there was a big change from the church being persecuted to it being embraced by the, quotes, converted emperor. The laws of the church became part of the laws of the land. Now, if you take design laws and incorporate them into a system that is used to and has been built upon imposed law with no change in the characters of those in power, what will you end up with? Well, it will be a system with some additional laws that will also be imposed. Here I've tried to show the process of what happened, starting with the pagan Roman Empire and then adding Constantine's conversion, in quotes, to Christianity. We end up with a Christian Roman Empire. If you take Roman Empire's imposed laws and add in some Christian design law, you're going to end up with the Roman Empire with just a few more imposed laws. It's not changing their concept of laws. And that is if Christian design law was even still understood as design, which it quite possibly wasn't by that time. The powers in that system were used to human imposed law and that is exactly how they treated the Christian laws that they incorporated into their system. It wouldn't have taken much for the laws of the church, supposedly the laws of God, to be thought of as imposed rather than design laws. Those laws were taken into a system that was very imposed law dominated. And so the early church quickly became of the same mindset 
imposed rather than design. And with that imposed law mindset, it was no problem for them to think to change the Sabbath commandment. As time went on, the church continued to be highly influenced by people who thought in legal terms. Here is a quote from a book on the Reformation. The great men who built up the Western Church were almost all trained Roman lawyers. Tertullian, Cyprian, Augustine, Gregory the Great were all men whose early training had been that of a Roman lawyer, a training which molded and shaped all their thinking, whether theological or ecclesiastical. John Calvin and even Martin Luther studied law. Continuing the quote, They instinctively regarded all questions as a great Roman lawyer would. They had the lawyer's craving for exact definitions. They had the lawyer's idea that the primary duty laid upon them was to enforce obedience to authority. No branch of Western Christendom has been able to free itself from the spell cast upon it by these Roman lawyers of the early centuries of the Christian Church. To show the extent to which the early church and the later translators into our modern Bible versions were influenced by this thinking, here is a quotation from the definition for the word condemnation from an evangelical dictionary. It is a good example of how legal the thinking of most theologians has become. Look at all the legal language used. I have emphasized each word that I consider to be regarded as a modern legal term. When it is discovered that a crime has been committed, that the law has been broken, the process of investigation may lead to formal charges being levied against a defendant. The process of litigation leads to the outcome, a verdict of acquittal or guilt. There is more. The verdict indicates that the defendant is either free from or accountable to the law's penalty for that crime. Thus the result is either vindication or condemnation. Condemnation can either refer to the legal status of liability to punishment or to the actual infliction of that punishment. A look at Wikipedia shows the great influence of the Roman legal system in our society. There are 395 terms in Wikipedia's partial list of Latin legal terms. A few commonly used in modern English are affidavit, corpus juris, fiat, habeas corpus, pro bono, subpoena, and there are many more, hundreds of them. So by the time the King James Version and then many other English versions were translated, this legal thinking was well entrenched and is reflected in the various versions. Over the last few hundred years, many word meanings have undergone changes that have caused further confusion. To help sort some of this out, in the Character of God and the Gospel Glossary, reference is often made to Webster's 1828 Dictionary. Here is a good example of a word that has changed meaning. Atonement had the original meaning of to be in a state of oneness, at one meant. In theology it later came to mean payment for sin. Graham Maxwell was the son of Arthur Maxwell, the author of the well-known Uncle Arthur's Bedtime Stories for Children. Graham well understood this use of atonement and the change in meaning. Graham had started studying Greek at age 17 and went on to study Hebrew, Aramaic, and Latin. Now I'm just going to include in here a brief two-minute sound clip of him speaking about atonement. What does atonement mean? Now, commonly, in the last century or two or three, it has come to mean making amends, paying a penalty to meet legal demands that adjustment in legal standing may be justly accomplished. That is not the original meaning of the term. And it is definitely not the meaning of the biblical word. The biblical word in Greek is katalage. There's no hint of making amends there. It's reconciliation. All the dictionaries agree that this word, atonement, is a made-up word. At one man. Now, that seems almost too cute to be true, but that's the way it started. But it was based on a verb, to one. Two people are fighting, and you are sent out to one them. Not win them, to one them, O-N-E. And then when you had succeeded in oneing people, then hopefully they would remain in a state of oneness. And the state of being at one, in harmony, is atonement. Now, if you want to read the history of the word, there's only one dictionary that really does it. That's the multi-volume Oxford English Dictionary. 
And if you look in there for the history of the word, it's very colorful. It shows how for a long time it was used in its original sense of being at one, reconciling people to harmony, friendship is often mentioned, unity, and so on. Now, later on, somehow, it was changed to mean making amends, paying penalty. And that's the way it's commonly used now. But that is not the original word, and that is not the meaning of the Greek. That's the way a word can develop. In summary, we need to understand the difference between imposed and design law. We need to always think of what law lens we are looking through. Is it the imposed law lens? The God of justice made the rules, and he enforces them, and every infraction must be paid for with blood. Or is it the design law lens? The God of love designed all his laws for our benefit and protection. When we transgress them, he does all he can to heal us of any hurt the sin has caused and to restore us to a trusting relationship with him.